to spill the secrets. is Universal Secrets with Tiffany Mack and Kevin Hale. I finally get to do this again. It's Tuesday night. You know what that means? <laughs> it's Universal Secrets with Tiffany Mack and Kevin Hale. I guess I should say it's Tiffany Tuesday. Is that what you're getting at? Tiffany, well, it's you can say that, <laughs> Tiffany Tuesday. It is, uh, it's, I, I, I'm a Tuesday night kind of guy. Doing it in here, doing it on here on um, April 9th, 2024, streaming on all our platforms. Tiffany, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing today? I'm good. Did you, uh, I see we survived the rapture yesterday. We did. Did yeah. you get to see it? No, being serious. Did you? Uh, um, you know, we, my mom actually went out and, and found some glasses for us and she gave them to me a few weeks ago and I had no no idea there was going to be an eclipse and i was just like huh glasses great okay and i put them in the corner so we finally made it to the day and i took the kids out and they did see a little bit of it uh, they were not very impressed um mainly because of all the cloud cover it was very difficult to it, see it in was. our region so that was that i mean it was interesting um you know but wasn't was it the wasn't last one in uh 2016, I think. Well, that was an interesting one. And I'll tell you why. Because my daughters and I were on our way out to go um, shopping or something like that. And I remember that day um, we were driving past a fire station and I look up and see this what looked like a UFO flying in front of this you know, in front of the sun and the moon and all the stuff. And I'm like, what the hell is that? So of course I pulled over at the fire station and the guys are out there and they're like, what the hell is going on? Did you see it? So there was like six of us that saw it. And I mean, I was going nuts. In the little area? Yes. And okay. it was, yeah. On Murphy Lane. I don't know if you know yeah, where that is. Know. So um, that, that was spectacular because it just about blew my mind that I would see a craft just sitting there and i was like what the oh. heck so i i always forget about that one until we talk about eclipses so yeah well what happened first? did you see yeah, anything at all yeah i saw it uh the glasses worked um you know the clouds broke away enough to get the effect and it was mm -hmm. uh, it was neat something mm -hmm. you don't see you know often and yeah. uh, uh and we're here um you know, it was sort of strange that, you know, um, my thought pattern is a little bit broken tonight. But right. what was funny was all of the hubbub that surrounded it. You know, everybody's talking about the National Guard being called into all these different regions. And, you know, there was so, so much uh, angst over what turned out to be pretty much nothing. Just, uh, so, yeah. Well, kind of a natural event now mm. what's cool you know and you can say what you will about the universe but you know the sun is what 90 some billion not billion million miles away right no clue Just, okay i think and then uh the moon is like 200 and some thousand miles or something like that but it's shaped the moon is shaped perfectly so when it does cross paths, the it fully covers. Yeah, I think it was like a, a. I think it's like four hundred times the size, and then four hundred. Something. I bet you our yeah. guest probably knows the. Yeah, yeah. we we probably He's have got a, a lot, lot of answers. answers. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tiffany, since our reboot, which mm -hmm. instead of you know maybe it's season four, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, opened up our uh i don't know thoughts as far as topics 
And tonight is a topic that, as far as I remember, we have not mm -hmm. talked about in, in the depth that we will mm -hmm. tonight. Right. Um, you know where I stand from a religion standpoint. Mm -hmm. Respectful. Uh, I, my thoughts are not shoved down anybody's throats. Now, at the same time, too, I don't want it. theirs. Shut Correct. And it, but the right people make for a great conversation. And this is one that, you know, that I think we're going to have a, have a good time talking about. And um, this is a guy that reached out to us and I always love those because mm -hmm. it kind of tells us they want to come on the show. Yeah. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, you want to bring him on or do you want to do bio? How do you want to do this? Yeah. Um, let's, let's bring him up and, and I'll uh, describe a little bit about John Myler. So, um, you know, when we were doing the the research on him, he he was uh, pleasant enough to send us as much information as he could. Everything. And I, <laughs> I loved I, it. Obviously, I, I told him that I would dig in and try to get as much as as I could. Um, but obviously I had no idea there was like 900 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is impressive next time, on his part. Right. Yeah. You need to give me a little bit more notice. You wanted the cliff that notes? Is that what you want? Uh, I, that would yeah. have been great. Actually, no, uh, the movie one, of my version. Books, yeah, one of my books does have a cliff note section in the appendix. Uh, yeah. I'll, I need to buy that one then. <laughs> the Christian UFOlogy book has a Cliff Notes appendix, and that's basically the entire book in maybe seven or eight pages. Very yeah, condensed. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, the cosmic mysteries of ufology and Christian ufology, uh, the apocalypse, and the enigmatic presence of aliens in biblical narratives. Um, so. <laughs> I'd like to give, I'd like you to just give us a little bit of your background. Um, tell us who you are, John. Okay. Um, I have a military background. Uh, so, you know, uh, retired military now. I, was, I uh, retired as the chief of cyber operations for the, the base that I was at, the mm -hmm. 144th Fighter Wing here in Fresno, California. We're a four corner unit. So, our mission is to protect the West Coast, and uh, that's the U.S. Western Air Defense Sector. So um, that's part of the, you know, our no-fail no mission that we had, and I was doing that for 25 years, and I ended up as the chief there. Uh, prior to that, I was active duty Army infantry, uh, and that dates back to the Panamanian conflict in, in, uh, in 1990. When you were a gunner there? <clears throat> I was an Is M60 gunner back then, yeah. Okay. But I was kind of an unusual cat for being an infantry grunt because uh, I sort of have this intellectual bent. Um, you know, I have two master degrees, for example. Um, not a normal thing for most of the guys to really just want to just dive into school head first and live there for 20 years. Um, and uh, I also had... Um, you know, I, I write books, you know, so I, of course, I sent you three books. And you've thir written 13 or published 13. 13. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I have 13 mm -hmm. out there right now. Um, so that kind of made me an oddball, but I was, I consider myself sort of a barbarian nerd with a wild streak streak, you know, um, uh, cause I, I love camping in wild, rugged, crazy stuff and jumping off cliffs and repelling and uh, helicopters and got to fly in an F-6 uh, and, and an F-15, actually. Uh, so that was <laughs> incredible. But at the same you time... Pass out? You know, they do anything fun? Did you pass out? Um, probably close to it. When we went vertical after takeoff, uh, that was like, I was glued to the seat. Uh, you know, five, <laughs> Your face was like this. Five, six Gs, you know, this, mm -hmm. like, you know. <laughs> And uh, basically a rocket straight up, you know, and then he went upside down and uh, the little dust particles floated up. And then I came kind of floating out of my seat. And really, I was at zero G at that point. And that was a mystical experience. Like the cockpit was kind of silent because we were faster than sound at that point. So we entered this period of just like silence. And 
when he went upside down, I'm looking and I see the curvature of the earth, you know, and the earth is above my head. So I'm really feeling like this is sort of like what an astronaut feels, you know, and uh, incredible, incredible experience that was. But um, that's my, my military background. So I don't think I would be able to uh, stay conscious during uh, an adventure like that, either that or the 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 window would probably be covered in whatever I had just eaten. Oh, so, <laughs> what that, I, pepperoni. <laughs> took a lot of concentration. I could yes. get pressed down in the seat. What I was hoping he wouldn't do is just one of these, you know, fall mm -hmm. out of the sky at negative G because everybody loses their lunch on that. No right. exception, even the pilots. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, the whole time he just kept me on positive G's. And you just have to do this thing they call the hatch hatch breathing technique. And you push it's down this on your violent way of breathing and forcing blood up into your head so you don't pass out. Oh, um, yeah. So fantastic. Yeah, I've heard about that, but it sounds so difficult to do. I mean, I was a, I was a swimmer. Um, and so I was very trained in in different forms of a whole breath holding techniques and things like mm -hmm. that but i'm i'm not sure even with being able to hold my breath for i don't know 200 meters i probably still wouldn't have been able to do that so i give you props for yeah. <laughs> for holding your lunch in yeah yeah oh thank you <laughs> uh, so Aside from the military aspect, uh, I always had this interest in spiritual things from a very young age. Um, and uh, part of my testimony starts with a story that my great grandmother told me um, while everybody was there at the house. Uh, so, you know, I could go into detail about that story, but basically she she represents two paradigms that were never an issue for her. She believed ETs were real. And she all because she saw one and she believed the Bible was real because she was the wife of a minister for 30 years. And they traveled the United States, big tent revivals dating back to the Great Depression. And uh, they traveled all over the United States. And uh, my great grandfather was a preacher and uh, he would give these sermons and stuff. And they basically lived on the road for years, you know. Um, but talk about devote. Um, Everything about her was all about Jesus and some of the stories she had that you would at least not consider as being out of place. She did. She was saved by an angel once, and her description of the angel was very interesting. And she literally saw Jesus physically manifest once, actually twice. But the one that carries the weight is the one where she was in a hospital following a stroke that almost killed her. She was paralyzed on the left side of her body. Doctors didn't know if she was going to be able to speak again. Uh, and she said Jesus walked into her room and smiled at her and then turned around and walked out. And when he smiled at her, her left side of her body came back and she was 100% healed. I think they call that God's grace, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So when, do, you, do you remember um, when your grandmother was born? Around the turn of the century. Okay. It was it was pretty close to the, you know, 1900. And pretty close do you remember, uh, did she mention where she was during those, those Kentucky. episodes? Where? Kentucky? Kentucky. So I, I have a couple oh. of pictures on that. So, you, do you know we live in Kentucky? Yes. Oh, okay. We're it was the plains Kentucky. of Kentucky. So uh, actually, let me, I could just bring that one up. Yeah, let me uh, bring up a couple pictures here. See if I could do a screen share on this. Uh, screen share. And um, window. So this is about my age. Uh, when I was visiting her house and she brought up the whole incident. So we're, we're all at the house. Uh, I'm sort of in my own little world back then. Um, literally my grandmother thought I was autistic at one point. Um, here's my great grandmother. It was my grandmother that her daughter that thought I was autistic because okay. I, I didn't talk until I was three. So I was kind of an, an oddball kid. Um, 
And then there's my both my great grandparents. Maybe you didn't have anything relevant to say at that time yet. Uh, that's that's what I said or what my mm -hmm. mom said because when mm -hmm. I did start talking, it was in full sentences. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. instead of a first word, it's like, "Mom, what's for dinner?" Right. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure I was going to get it right. <laughs> that's it. It's very <clears throat> funny that you're you're saying that your family was uh, in Kentucky at the time because we have a lot of parallels. Um, my grandfather's oldest sister was my grandfather was born in I think 1927 I think um, 1929 maybe but his older sister said that she saw a UFO land on their property wow. and they had a couple thousand acres uh, within our family for years and years and years but um, this was one of the stories that was passed down and and I didn't even really think about it until Kevin and I started doing this show and thinking, gosh, there's got to be some kind of familial connection with all of these uh, visitations and things like that. So, you know, we've we've actually had conversations with our family and we call them generational talks because we've each one of the the girls in our family have had these stories and these experiences. So I wanted to know, do you feel like this might be something that is a personal connection with your family lineage? Um, well, it was certainly something that set the tone that evening. When What when is she... this? <laughs> so everybody was in all of these different conversations in the living room when um, grandma was just reading a newspaper. And then she suddenly said, I have an announcement to the family. Uh, which shouldn't happen very often for her to just maybe basically tell everybody to shut up and listen. Um, and then she started to read this newspaper article, and it was something like this. It was in 1975, uh, I think the year before Close Encounters of the Third Kind was made. And that opening scene of Close Encounters of the Third Kind was pretty much what she read in the newspaper. There was a wild goose chase between these police cars and UFO flying around. Mm -hmm. Dara County. And when she, everybody's, I, I'm five years old. So I'm looking around at people's faces and I'm like puzzled. Like, why is everybody looking like this? Because this is my great grandmother who had the angelic visitation, who saw Jesus and was all about Jesus. If the TV was on, it was an evangelist. If the radio was playing, it was gospel music. So the, the UFO thing didn't really fit. And people were kind of puzzled. And then, so when she dropped the paper, she set the paper down. And then she said, when I was a, a little girl, I saw a UFO. And she proceeded to tell this story that her and her sister were out on the plains of Kentucky. So at the time, neither of them had ever even seen. Um, they'd never even seen uh, a car, uh, much less a UFO. They'd never seen anything fly. They'd never seen anything motorized because they live way out in the middle of nowhere. And they had a wagon, horses, you know, still part of the Old West where they lived. And um, they seen this thing fly by. It was a cigar-shaped UFO. Um, it was uh, like a polished aluminum, she said. And they'd never seen anything made of a material like that. And it was amazing. And it had this bubble on the top. And uh, she said they were close enough that they even saw the guy turn his head and look at him as he flew by. And that was pretty am an amazing thing that they were shocked, right? They were like, how in the world? Um, let me stop sharing the screen here. Um, they went and told their, their mother, right? And this woman was very, you know, pretty strict. And she cared about, you know, what people thought about the family and stuff. And she didn't want anybody thinking that her kids were crazy or anything weird she didn't want any gossip or nothing like that and so she told them don't ever tell anybody this story ever again i don't want to hear anything else about this you could just put away your little child daydreaming fantasy or whatever and get on with your lives and i don't want to hear this anymore period and well, they were really kind of put off, like, you know, they only had each other to confide in, but they listened to her. They didn't tell anybody. And unfortunately, her sister died a couple of years after that. So 
some 70 years later, here she is sitting in the living room reading this newspaper article, and she comes across this description of this thing, and all this comes back, and she's like, oh, <laughs> click. And, at, you know, to sum it up, she basically just said, you know what, I don't care what people think, those things are real, period. She didn't have a problem trying to reconcile it. She just figured the Bible's real, which she literally told me she was on her 27th reading uh, when I asked her once. So she believed the Bible, definitely. She also believed that there was ET life. And it's just for her, it was just more of God's creation. Um, so that was formative, formative for me because being five years old, I'm asking my mom, you know, driving home, what's this all about? Um, what What's that? thing that grandma said she saw and of course we were avid star trek fans so it made it really easy for my mom to explain that uh oh you know star trek um it's probably a lot more real than what people think and so okay i get it a show something about the show seemed real to me anyway so it, it even at five years old i could look out the stars and say that that's not empty you know it, it's there's more to this uh, so I had always been like that. So my mom was sort of the hippie generation and my sister was into like messing around with occult type things. And so I had her influence in like ghost hunting and things like that. And we had uh, all kinds of different things happen as I was growing up, uh, paranormal related. So those kind of things just happen in my family. Uh so it's no mistake that my great grandmother saw a UFO and she saw other things and other people in my family have seen things as well, experienced things and me too. So I really got into the paranormal and my mom saw how interested I was. And at that very young age, she decided to subscribe to Reader's Digest, uh, Mysteries of the Unknown. Uh, and there was like a multi-volume set. And I think the total set was like 24 volumes. They, the thing I didn't like about them is they had this pentagram on the back, you know, the, this five. I, I didn't like that very much. It bugged me with the goat head. Mm. Uh, but the, the overall books were basically Mysteries of the Unknown. And I absorbed those books. You know, I, I barely knew how to read. And I'm all just reading every page of it. So in terms of learning how to read, uh, it was a lot of practice there because I memorized pretty much everything in those uh, books. And I was a walking encyclopedia literally at a very young age um and the older i got i was always buying books i've gravitated to anything supernatural um became kind of like this fox molder right and um ufos in particular though I, I i probably specialized in that a little bit more than the other stuff but i i did learn about a lot of different paranormal things and um got really into the new age um, so back then I was very open-minded. If you would have asked me if I was a Christian, I would have told you, yes, based, based on my, my great grandmother and just staying at her house and listening to Jesus, but basic things like the Trinity, like, um, you know, just, just really basic things like the Trinity, for example, I, I wouldn't have been able to explain it. And, uh, I, I would have said that, oh, well, you know, um, evolution is probably true, and the Bible's just got some uh, symbolic way of describing it. When you say the Trinity, are you talking about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? Or Correct. You, okay. Correct. Okay. So what, what about that? Oh, the plurality bothered you. Well, I, I just didn't understand it. I okay. couldn't explain it. I didn't know that the Bible literally says that the universe and everything in it was created through Jesus. Hmm. So I, I would have said, well, Jesus is the Son of God, but I didn't know. I couldn't quote you, you know. Colossians, I think it's Colossians 120 through through him, everything was made. It's John chapter one. It's all over in the in the New Testament that all of creation was created, that God the Father created everything that, that exists through Jesus, that he mm -hmm. was literally God. I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. Uh, and that's a very basic Christian principle or you know, thing to to understand, to wrap your head around. Um but you know, I so I, I was into all of this occulty and new age things, and it got to where reading wasn't enough. Uh, I wanted to experiment. Um, so I got into, you know, self-hypnosis, past life regression. I actually did that. I found out that I was possessed 
uh, by somebody who drowned near our house when I was a kid. And uh, I did an exorcism on myself. <laughs> that, that, that was very bizarre. But I have no other way to explain it. I, I believe that I literally was through possessed. through um, like a, a, a yeah. self hypnosis yeah. type deal. Yeah. Uh, I followed the prescription given in a book called Past Life, Future Lives. And she gave a script in the back of the book. And she said, you could re record this and it's you talking mm -hmm. and you you could fill it in the gaps on certain things and elaborate. Because you're giving yourself instructions to relax. You're giving yourself instructions to just let your mind wander and relax and just allow memories to come to you. And so uh, I created this tape. It was extremely boring. And uh, then I laid on the bed. I was all alone. I made sure and no interruptions for a block of time. And then I laid down and I put the earphones on. And I started listening to the tape and I passed out. I thought I passed out. I thought that it was so boring that I just fell asleep, listening to myself talking, regressing myself. And I had this dream. <clears throat> so eventually uh, my eyes popped open and then I hear my voice on the tape saying, Tin, you are now awake. Stop the tape. Like, well, that's a pretty interesting coincidence to wake up exactly on cue like that so I stopped the tape and then I sat up on the bed and I'm kind of like thinking you know I, I was dreaming something and uh, I started recalling the dream and uh, I remember the dream was a place that I used to play me and my brother used to play there uh, when we were kids and it was about a half mile from our ranch house in Madera a uh, very dangerous place <laughs> of course we were kids, we gravitated to the most dangerous location and <laughs> stuck around there, did the most dangerous things. So um, there was a, uh, a river near our house, the river bottom of the Madera River, and it was a dam right there. And we were playing where the dam is. And there, there was huge sand hills that were like 40 feet high. And we would run and leap off the top of these sand hills at full speed as, <laughs> as high and as far as we could. And they were at just the right angle that you could just do that. And the sand was nice and soft. So we would just leap off and Sounds fun. fly down like 20 <laughs> feet and then land. So we used to go in there and play sometimes. Uh, but in the dream, I was there uh, at the dam, crossing the dam, and I fell in. And I got sucked under, and I drowned in the dream. In the dream. <laughs> in the dream. Yeah. And I floated up out of the water and I was kind of just drifting around aimless, like not knowing where I was at, confused, lost, like what happened. And I saw a little kid and I went over to the little kid and I tapped him like on the shoulder to get his attention. Next thing I know, I'm looking through his eyes and I'm looking around and then I woke up and then I remembered the little kid looked like me. I'm like, wait a second. What did I just dream? I think I was this guy. Um, and then I remembered, it, it came back to my memory that I remembered that there was a person that we knew, not a really pleasant guy. He was 21 years old. Uh, I was babysat at their house a couple times, not good people, not a good place. <laughs> but I do remember this guy. I remembered his name. He had this muscle car. He would pour gasoline on the tires and peel out just to make fire come off the tires. Just stupid stuff. So I remembered this guy. And then I remembered hearing that he drowned in that, that canal right there at the dam where we, playing, we, we were playing. And then it occurred to me that guy drowned and I just dreamed of drowning right where I remember that guy drowning. I think I'm that guy. And, and it just kind of freaked me out. This this huge epiphany just, you know, sitting there on my bed. And I'm thinking, it, it, right when I came to that conclusion, something weird started happening in my head. Like part of me was waking up and realizing what I did. Or what he did. And then I walked over and I opened the, 
the door to my locker, which has a big mirror, and I'm looking at my face in the mirror, and part of my consciousness is somebody else saying, this is not you. You do not look like this. You are not this person. You ripped off this kid's body. And it was pissing me off because I remember as a little kid, a lot of things changed about my personality kind of radically around five, six years old. I started wearing different clothes. Um, some of my mannerisms changed. My, my color, I, my favorite color used to be blue, navy blue. And then it became dark green. I, I don't know why. You know, why would have my color, my favorite color suddenly change? Now, some of these things happen, but all of this stuff is just flooding through my mind. And um, the most weirdest part was just looking at my face and seeing me and expecting to see another person or feeling like I should be looking at another person and feeling like I did something wrong. And then confusing the I with, wait a minute, that's not me. That's somebody else. And when I finally determined that, okay, this is somebody that took over my body or shared my body and my consciousness, I don't think he meant to, but I think he just sort of fell into me and over time just sort of became me, absorbed into me and wasn't fully aware of what he did or that he was an independent consciousness. He just sort of melted with my consciousness, I guess. Um, but when I had the dream, it's like he woke up and realized what happened. And then I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of me now. You need to get out. You need to leave now. And I felt this weird feeling like suddenly something was gone. And I felt like a lot better. <laughs> I like, I, like a weight was lifted off of me, you know? And I what, was like, what was your age at this? How I, I was, you? I was 20 years old when this okay. happened. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Well, that was a, a trip, and um, that have was. You, have you done I any became... more? Have you done any any research into um, like the idea of entities coming into your own body and sort of taking over? Have you Have you done a any lot. research on that? What a did lot. you end up coming up with? So, I I had this whole section that I put in one of my books, mm -hmm. uh, Aliens in the Bible, uh, a biblical perspective of supernatural entities, um, realms of existence and phenomenon. So I have a huge wide spectrum, not just UFOs in that book. I talk about ghosts and, and reincarnation is one of the subjects. And I honestly think uh, that reincarnation isn't what people think it is. I think it's possession. Not not and I don't think possession is relegated to just demons, because honestly, if you look at the original Hebrew words, demon uh, is raphim, uh, a devil, in in uh, devil or demon, um, translated from the Hebrew, it comes from the word raphim, which is the same word used for these nephilim yeah. creatures that were hybrid, part mm -hmm. angel, part human, or part angel, part animal, and. Um, the same word is used for, for demon. So essentially, a demon is the ghost of a Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that that's the only kind of spirit that a person can be possessed by, because the Bible talks about being possessed by unclean spirits, by familiar spirits. It has different names for these, and it's not always demon. And the Bible isn't necessarily very clear about... Um, exactly the, the, the dimension of hell and the full scope of it. It's not black and white like people think, like you die, you either go to heaven, you go to hell. There's no in-between because there are ghosts. There is such a thing as ghosts. And Jesus even defined it uh, when Jesus came back. He himself was, he said, look, I'm not a ghost. Touch me. I'm flesh and blood. And if there were no such thing as ghosts, that was his prime opportunity to just tell them there's no such thing as ghosts. And eliminate it. Instead, he gave definition to it. A ghost doesn't have a physical body anymore, is basically what he said. Uh, and, and then we know when you die, your spirit comes out, and then your spirit goes somewhere. So there is the spirit apart from the body, but being here in this world, uh, it's possible for spirits to be in this world. And um, it happens all the time. 
And uh, I did research on, you know, well, how does this happen? Because that doesn't necessarily jive with the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, which sort of gives you that very strict, narrow interpretation of here's heaven, you know, here's hell. And then you go to this place or that place. And it's a story about this guy that's stuck in hell and he wants to go warn people about hell and he can't um, because he's stuck there. Right. So that's just that one example of one person right i don't think it was that parable was meant as a one size fits all for everyone who dies mm -hmm. um i think if you're not saved that this whole idea of purgatory probably is a lot more accurate with the exception that true believers who are faithful don't end up in purgatory because that that's where Christianity, Protestant, differs from Catholicism. Catholicism is like, yeah, Jesus went to the cross, but you're going to have to do a little more until you're finally good enough, and then you go to heaven. And I, I don't think that's what purgatory is. I think purgatory is a place of extended grace, where, if anything, you know, if it's a real place that exists at all, and I read about this actually in astral projection books too, so it's <laughs> I'm kind of cobbling these things together from all of these interesting sources, but. Um, when a person dies and they're not a believer, they sink into one of these different levels of the earth. Um, the worst places are deep down, like the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, where he's in burning torment. That's the worst. But there's other places that are like very near the surface of the earth or even on the surface of the earth, but they're like dimensionally shifted. Um, have you seen Lord of the Rings, for example, the movie Lord of the Rings? Mm hmm. Frodo puts the ring on. What happens? From he, our perspective, he disappears, right? Right. But from his perspective, he still sees you. But he's it's, still there. it's like a different dimension, though. It's, it's like a different dimension, but he's still yeah. there. It's like overlaid. Right. So he could perceive some of it. But then he's seeing these Nazgul creatures that are like physical to him in that mm -hmm. place. That is an, what could be described as an upper dimension of hell. And there are places on this earth. On the you know in our realm where the ground is cursed so example uh, a murder uh and you see an example of this actually in genesis um where abel is killed by his brother cain and when god comes to visit he says your brother's blood is crying out from the ground that's a haunting mm -hmm. and it's even reiterated in the new testament in the book of hebrews where it states that by faith, Abel spoke to the Lord, even though he was dead. So he had an ability by faith to still reside in that location and not sink down into the lower realms. Abel was a righteous person, too, at that time. So there's no reason why he would have sunk down. I think spirits gravitate to the area where they belong. It's like a vibrational frequency thing. If you're a really crappy person you're going to sink down to the lowest depths into torment if you're a person that has all these really you know good very ethical beliefs but there's certain things that you don't accept because you are not lined up in a certain way uh with some key ingredients uh then you might be one of these people that are sort of wandering around on the surface of the planet and uh, not being seen or heard by people for the most part, but in a really annoying situation. Um, everything that applies to ghosts and all these ghost hunting shows basically applies in that situation. And I believe that's what happened to me, that I got possessed by the spirit of somebody who was deceased. Um, he wasn't bad enough to be apprehended by a demon. That's another thing that happens. Demons come to the surface and they look for wandering spirits and they try to get them. Uh, there's a benefit to that, apparently, like some like energy or whatever. I'm a fan of this show, The Dead Files, um, which I probably shouldn't be as a Christian, but I could tell you, I, I there's something about the show where I learn about spiritual things mm -hmm. and I find parallels, and that's what I've always done. Um, that book, well, but, the Bible. but reading and watching things and trying to gather information is not yeah. reading. A, a demonic activity i mean just filling your brain with knowledge and being able to translate <clears throat> it is is important yeah 
and that's that's kind of what I think. And mm -hmm. you know, I have the Bible as my source guide, my blueprint on what I define as right or wrong. So when I see things that are not that I don't think are right, you know, the little flags go off in my head, and you know, I know where to draw the line on that kind of stuff. Um, that show though does kind of open things up from time to time. I, I I've watched shows where after watching a, some of them haunting activity can start happening in the house. And then I have to do a, a exorcism on the home, you know, do you can, I mean, exorcism is a strong word. So cleansing maybe. Uh, yes, but reading Psalm 91. So hey, when I had my, my encounter, uh, so when I was a kid and I was all into the new age and, and stuff and, and up through the army, I was heavily into the new age. And then at the darkest time of my life, after I got out of the army, um, I was like addicted to all this stuff. I was a big party hound. Um, and I sort of thought I was happy, you know, free as a bird out of the army, you know, finally getting to live and, and it just totally went nuts uh, in the party scene. But honestly, I was kind of miserable and I didn't know it. Uh, and I had this dream at where Jesus came to me in a helicopter. And so I didn't know it was him, right? This Black Hawk came down and it landed. And uh, the door opened in the Black Hawk. Where I happened to be at was this like cartel compound. And there were people standing around with guns and stuff. I was looking for drugs. That's how I ended up there inadvertently. And uh, me and a buddy of mine were, he was with me in the dream. And we were scared and like wondering how are we going to get out of here? We just really dug ourselves a big hole uh, ending up in this place. Suddenly this helicopter comes in, lands down, uh, door opens up and we hear a voice say, get in. We're not arguing. We want out of there. We don't care who's flying. We just want out of there. So we jump in, the door shuts. He flies away. The helicopter suddenly dive bombs and we're glued to the seat. And it goes into a tunnel for a train. And we're screaming and freaking out. It comes out the other side of the tunnel. And there's these power lines. And we scream because we think we're going to hit the power lines. And uh, I, I know what happens when a helicopter hits a power line. Because in Panama, we were actually, we saw that. And we, we actually had to do a cleanup. Somebody tried to jump out of the helicopter. Not advisable. Don't jump out of a helicopter if you ever happen to be in one and it's going down. But... You know, that was still fresh in my mind coming from Panama. And he comes and does a flip around these helicopter, uh, around these uh, power lines. And we're screaming. Uh, and, and then after he does this, I guess is what, just to show his his expertise as a pilot, you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, hey, by the way, I could fly a helicopter through tunnels and do flips on stuff, you know. Um, so that really piques my curiosity, like who in the world is flying this thing? And I lean forward, and the chair is indented, and the controls are moving around. He's invisible. Whoever it is flying it made himself invisible. And I'm just, like, puzzled. And I sit back, and I look at my buddy, and I'm like, Ramey, the pilot's invisible. How do you explain that? And we're just kind of lost, like, what the heck, you know? But all this beautiful sunlight then came into the, the helicopter, right? And we're, like, looking around, like, wow, this is awesome. And we look out and there's beautiful golden fields of wheat as far as the eye could see. And it's just this pleasantness and this peace just saturated us. And it's like all of the cares and worries of the world just gone. And I felt so at peace, like this huge weight was lifted off of me. And uh, I was like, wow. This and this is, this is another dream, correct? This is the same dream, the helicopter dream. Okay. The yeah. Right. right. Um, not the dream of the... Right, I'm a right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, he ends up landing the helicopter. The door opens, says, "Get out!" I get out. We're the same place I started, but everybody's dead. It was a bloodbath. So he saved us from whatever. Uh, something terrible happened right after he pulled us out of there, and then he dropped us off at the same place. My friend jumps back into the helicopter because he tells him to, and then off he flies. Um, me and this friend, we have, uh, Ramey is his name. We have interesting parallels in life that I, I have a number of paranormal stories with him. He actually ended up splitting from my life at that point in time. 
um, so we still kept in contact, but he went on a different path. Um, this was later after, you know, after it came out of the dream and everything. So the dream was prophetic. It showed me what was going to happen with our friendship too. Um, but the, the gate to the compound was open. And so I just walked out the gate and I felt so free and so alive. And then I woke up from the dream and I'm laying there in the bed and I knew something significant happened because I just felt it. Right. So I started re recalling the dream I'm like, oh, yeah, I was in this helicopter. We were flying around. It was that compound, uh, really bad place. Uh, and then I got to the part with the pilot. And um, I said, oh, yeah, there was that weird part about the invisible pilot. Who was that pilot? And I actually asked the question out loud as I'm just thinking through the dream and talking to myself in the bed. And audibly, I heard the name Jesus answer in my ear. Like, like he got so close, his whiskers are touching my ear and said, Jesus. And it was so forceful and so powerful and audible. This, this energy just shot through my body. And I felt all of this love just drop on me like a ton of bricks. And it was the most amazing feeling. And it kind of returned me to the peace that I felt in the dream. Uh, but just times a thousand I fell out of the bed. I felt like he was standing right there in my bedroom, uh, Jesus. And um, I was like, you know, why, why me? You know, why would you come to me? Why would you tell me I, I don't deserve this? You know, I <laughs> and I just started looking at my whole life and everything. And then it's like for the first time, the blinders were turned off and I, I saw everything completely different. And it's I guess it's a way of it was like Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Yeah. Uh, he wakes up on Christmas morning and he's a different person because this dream was so profound or with him, it was a series of dreams with me as one that it just completely flipped everything on its head. And at that point, I'm like, OK, I got to get serious about God. I, I'm a Christian now. I, I'm really I got to believe now this this is he came to me. I owe him this. I, I can't even say that I don't believe him. I don't even have that option. Um, so what I have, I don't even know if you could call it faith because I literally heard him. So I started making this list of like, you know, what do I do? You know, uh, uh, Christians, they, they read the Bible, they pray, they go to church, you know, they, they get baptized. They got to do that. So I'm just dithering and changing all of my life. And, um, on that very first day, I started reading the Bible, uh, opened it Genesis chapter one and only a couple pages in. Genesis chapter 6, I'm reading about these angels descended to earth, intermarried with the daughters of men, and begat children that were giants. They were men of renown. They were extremely wicked. And all of this is the backstory of the flood of Noah. And I'm like, okay, I remember the flood of Noah. And I do remember some little hint of a giant because uh, at my grandma's house, she read about David and Goliath, right? I just kind of thought the guy was a big dude. Right. I didn't think he was like literally, you know, nine <laughs> feet tall <laughs> or so, larger. Yeah. <laughs> or larger, 12 feet. Um, yeah. Uh, King Og's bed was uh, nine and a half feet, I believe. But uh, I'm like reading this in Genesis and I'm like, wait a second, because then my my brain is still the same. I still have this encyclopedia of the paranormal in there. And my paranormal head is saying. I know what that is. And I remembered like some of the stuff from ancient uh, ancient alien type stuff like Von Donakin and, and all of that. He would quote from the Bible, but he didn't necessarily believe in it. Uh, he just believed in it to support his alien hypothesis and that God is actually an ET. Uh, and basically the whole ancient astronaut realm is in that camp, that God mm -hmm. is an ET, that people were seated on Earth this dates back to panspermia. The philosophers, Greek philosophers, talked about that. But then they also have all of their legends. You got the uh, Greek legends, Zeus and Perseus, and all of them. That the legends go into depth, like that these beings came here. They shape shifted, mated with animals, and um, you know. But the Bible actually talks about that too. But the Bible's different than all of these other sources because the Bible says these are angels in disobedience to God, that they were glorified beings 
but they reverted to an earlier form that reproduced and they started reproducing again with humans crossing with us and it was completely forbidden uh that was the abomination that they committed and they ended up being thrown down into tartars for doing it and their children almost destroyed the planet uh these giants not all of them were giants the, the actual word nephilim means fallen fallen ones it translates to fallen ones but in the greek when it translated into greek it's very close to the word for giant and a lot of them were giants so they just use that word uh giant but it actually means fallen one and so some of them were were like regular sized humans but many were giants also i honestly think that they were experimenting with creating a superior genetically superior human and corrupting the human race to prevent the messiah from being born because in genesis 3 15 which precedes genesis 6 it's like very very in the beginning right after adam and eve sin god says to eve the seed of the woman will stomp on the head of the serpent and the serpent will bite his heel that's the first prophecy about jesus so right away, God already knew and already established his plan for a Messiah and to fix this problem of sin right off the bat. So first thing he said is he says a prophecy about Jesus. Well, Satan's known that, and he doesn't want this to happen. He wants to overcome that. And so there's this war of good and evil that started in the heavens that predates humanity. It actually started with the angels. And it's documented in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It's just some really cool otherworldly stuff in there also. And uh, just the more I started reading all these things, my mind was just on fire. And I'm writing all the notes in the Bible and just taking all these notes. And before I knew it, I'm writing a book. Uh, I have enough notes just from spontaneously out of compulsion like i know what this is oh i know what this is oh i know what this is there's just so much paranormal stuff in the bible it was a gold mine i i didn't realize it was that paranormal and um, i tell my daughters all the time there i have an older uh, my oldest daughter is um more like kevin <laughs> we'll put it we'll put it that way he's she's more like funny kevin. cool what else what else is she like okay. adorable you Ador know. okay thank you You're yeah. but she she has a, a problem with um the religion that is being as she says forced down her throat and it's not that it's being forced it's that i i don't think she understands all of the stories and the symbol the symbolism in the bible and there's some amazing stories of of paranormal activity that that is it's 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 hard to question something that was written well and written rewritten multiple times but these stories yeah, the Dead sea have, scrolls, right. Know, these yeah. stories have lasted for thousands of years. There are different um, versions of a lot of them. But how did how do your what did you what did you find when it came to looking into other faiths? Like, um, did you did you ever look into um, the Quran or? Um, I did. Did you find any similarities that that well other were... faiths they, they the other faiths all over the world they all have versions of the Nephilim that's prolific right. there's right. over 650 that I know of specifically that I read a, a reference from another book about the Nephilim which uh, shows that, that it's not just a a Catholic view this is something that's sort of a worldwide yeah. view and so the Book of Enoch the early church the early church followed that yes these were angels mating with humans they weren't supposed to do that and their children were abhorrently evil they led to so much wickedness in the earth that god wiped them out in the flood of noah to save humanity um do you, you think it was thing. really saving them or do you think that he had a goal for what humanity was supposed to look like and it was not being fulfilled well there's that but i also think that it said that noah was pure in his generations and he was a rarity he was also he was born glowing family. right uh no that's the um that's the sumerian version uh but the hebrew version he wasn't okay there's just nothing about him born glowing they make him actually okay. sound like a nephilim in the 
in the Sumerian. It, it, yeah, there's there's some He's there's some gone. interesting thoughts yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, but um, so it says he was pure in his generations, specifically mm -hmm. referring to his genetics that it was mm -hmm. not polluted. Right. So he and his family were pretty much the last, and God waited because of His mercy until there was like almost no humans left. Because these giants, they were also known for eating people. They were cannibals. And they were just extremely violent. I mean, every thought of their imagination was only on evil continually. Genesis 6-4. That's bad. We're not even that bad now, even though we're, we're going in that direction. But We have some these, tainted life forms. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, these Nephilim were really bad. Yeah. Let, me, yeah. let, let's, let me pump the brakes here. This is a good time for me to jump in. Um, God is almighty. God is everything. You know, I can quote, you know, the, the familiar quote, why does God let bad things happen to good people? If you got these beings that are just eating and just, you know, decimating humans or other people, why does he let that happen? Okay. This is awesome. Because I like getting these theological questions. So uh, God allows evil because he is love. So that's a hard one to grasp. A lot of people struggle with it. The uh, Bible very succinctly defines God as love. John says it twice, that specific phrase, God is love. So if you want to understand God, try to understand love. Now, love is one of those things It's like, Okay, it's simple. A little kid can understand it. And at the same time, it's so profound that when you analyze the behavior of a person that they do certain things because of love, you scratch your head. You can't quantify it. You can't make 100% sense out of it. And then that's just with a human understanding of love. And I, I think that humans can understand it because that's part of our divine nature. It's the selfless part of us that is the spirit. Our flesh, though, is pretty darn selfish. So that's where Adam and Eve split. And since original sin was thrown into this world and we're all born into it, we're struggling with the flesh more than anything. But God's challenge from the beginning is to grant free will to children that have the ability to disobey him. And I could say probably for possibly billions of years, the universe, the cosmos, and all the angels that existed before humanity for countless eons existed in peace and harmony in a perfect universe. It was like heaven 1.0. But God knew eventually this scoundrel Lucifer was going to get big in the head. He was going to put two and two together and come up with this whole different way of thinking of things. But if God just come in and stomp him out, without letting that play out and letting everyone learn why anything other than love is the wrong answer. You don't want to allow that in your perfect universe or it won't continue to be a perfect universe. Then if they don't learn, if they're just told, do as I say, just shut up, then they'll never learn. Right. So, you, you're never allowed to make your own decisions. Exactly. The the thing I'm going to add to what Kevin said, and I think this is where he's going, but uh, it also states that our God is a vengeful God and he's a jealous God. So um, jealousy stemming from love. Yeah. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. I love my husband. I don't want anybody to have him. That type of thing on steroids and nothing. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Think, think about some examples of people fueled with burning anger, right? There's a lot of things that'll piss a person off, but do you have kids? Who has kids, right? Think of somebody torturing your kids. Can you think of anything that would infuriate you more than that? I would do bad things. Yeah, that's the anger and fury side of love. So a lot of people have it kind of thinking that love and hate are opposite. No, they're they're not really opposite. Love and selfishness are opposites. Love is purely selfless, and Satan is purely 
selfish. That's the difference. But there is a big dichotomy. Hatred, actually, yeah, and, and hate and anger and fury and rage can actually come directly from love. So that's a lot of, it, that's why I say love is it's very profound. It's very, it's complicated to understand all of the facets. So when you go to answer huge theological questions about creation, the origin of creation and all life as we know it, and God having children and wanting them to get along and allowing grace, you know, like, okay, you know, stop doing that, you know, and um, mercy, you know, grace is where you give them something they don't deserve. Uh, mercy is where you withhold punishment that they do deserve. God gives both of those, you know, and, and it's so easy for us in our very limited brain to point fingers and make accusations. Well, that's exactly what Satan did. You know, Satan was probably upset that God is so lenient because uh, Satan is a control freak. Uh, he's a legalistic control freak. And so he likes to play this game and God is allowing him to do it in order for everyone to learn. Because if it all plays out. Well, how much learning do we have to go through? I mean, this is well, this is actually what we have it on the light side, if you think about it, because this okay. war in the heavens has probably been going on for millions or even billions of years. So a lot, uh, because you're thinking in a temporal mindset in linear time, God's eternal. He's the God, the father is outside of time space. He created time itself, which we, we can't really con conceive of that. And all of this war in the heavens and everything, a billion years is, is a scratch to God. It's a blip. It's a period of time where he's taking creation 1.0 debugging it with free will, this new layer of complexity and beauty to love, and then purging out the evil. And then in the end, he's going to have a free will creation that is perfect again. And that's where God is at. And that's what he, he sees it from the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. So to him, it's a blip. And honestly, I think if we had his perception, then we would understand it. And that's what Judgment Day is all about. Judgment Day is where we're going to go there and we're going to understand. He's going to have a lifetime full of examples of, remember when you thought this? Remember when you did that? Remember when you said this? Remember when you went there? Look what happened. It'll be a learning experience and a very humbling one. And I, I think that that's the big reason why in the Old Testament, in the book of Micah, it says there's basically three things that, that are really good to live by. Love mercy, do the right thing, walk humbly before the Lord. Simple as that. So I can you, buy the first two. I can buy the first two. Well, the, I mean, the first two are forgiven. The third one is faith or belief. Right. Well, humility, though. Without humility, you can I'll never buy, admit yep. wrongdoing. And, and it's human nature to see wrongdoing in others. Mm. Even a little kid knows what's fair and what's not when it comes to being mistreated themselves. Now, when it comes to them exhibiting their own selfish behavior and being a bully or something like that, they're a little blind on that part. And that's just part of the flesh. And that's in a microcosm what God is trying to teach us. You know, mm -hmm. he's trying to mature us, grow us up. And that's what this whole life is about. The whole thing is just a test to see if we can learn those three simple things. What's your response to when... This is one of the one things that I cringe about. When I hear people, when something good happens in their life, they quote their quote is "God is good." But if something bad goes wrong, somebody dies from cancer or something, that's God working in mysterious ways. Why is why isn't their response "God is bad"? Then, well, uh, I I might want to kind of slap somebody saying that God works in mysterious ways personally. And my pastor whose wife died three years ago would probably do the same thing. Uh, he's got a lot of grace, but you know, there's just some things that when a person goes through something hard, you don't want to toss a marshmallow in their direction and say, you know, Oh, you know, uh, you know, God's got another flower in heaven. You know, it's just like, come on, man. When somebody's going through something hard, sometimes all you could do is just be with them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
But if that, they if they survive, awesome. then it's a miracle, God's grace. But yeah. if they don't, then you know it's working in mysterious ways. That to me is hypocrisy. Or or other explanations, you know, working in mysterious ways. But um, the bottom line is we don't have an infinite mind, and we don't oh, have all the true. variables. I'm with and you. And there's a lot of stuff that happens that's just shit, you know. Uh, <laughs> we could agree on that. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it all started because Adam and Eve were given a perfect paradise. And they screwed it up. So other people screw up and dump their crap on us all the time. You know, but that's that's just humanity. I mean, we, we, we make mistakes that's over and over and over. And we're still continuing on. We're still here <laughs> with and, and as it, many it, damn mistakes as we've made right. throughout the, you know, the millennia. We still are here. Right. I don't know, but and, if, and you, if you go by the past, to that coin, you know, because we on the flip side screw people over. We, we say things that half the time, not even realizing that we piss somebody off or yeah, step yeah. on somebody or sometimes it's intentional, you know? Uh, so, uh, that's that's the whole forgiveness thing. There's two sides of that forgiveness coin. We all want to be forgiven, you know, unless we can't even forgive ourselves. Some people are in that boat. But honestly, you're not getting anywhere unless you forgive others and you forgive yourself. And uh, that Jesus. But aren't, is aren't there some things that are just unforgiven? Uh, not according to Jesus. And you uh, you do something to my kids or family or friends. Yeah. It's and it may not be humanly possible. I, I have heard testimony of people who endured things that, um, for example, there was a Jew who survived the Nazi concentration camps and uh, saw his friends murdered uh, by these heartless Nazis. And the guy who ran the place ended up getting out and was pardoned, um, wasn't nailed with a war trial, you know, or, you know, the Nuremberg trial or whatever it was. And years later, uh, he was giving a sermon that the Jew guy was giving a sermon on forgiveness. And the Nazi guy, former Nazi, was there in the audience. He didn't know it. But the guy came up to him afterward and uh, saw him. And he said, man, that was the most beautiful thing I ever heard in my life. And, I, you know, I've just been living with this. And it, that, Guilt. as he's talking, then... Mm -hmm. The Jewish guy finally suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this is the monster. Mm. And he started shaking like, you know, all of it just came rushing back. And he was like, man, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. I went through hell. Uh, I, I don't understand this. But in his mind, he also heard the Holy Spirit telling him, shake his hand. Just shake his hand. Mm. You don't feel it. It's not in your heart. I understand you hate him shake his hand and he just kept hearing this right he's like well that's just god being really darn annoying so out of obedience he lifts his hand to shake his hand and he said when that guy grabbed his hand something supernatural happened to him it just like boom this liquid love poured through his body and he felt forgiveness come out of him and it was supernatural and he said that was not him that was god entering him and changing him from the inside out. And his part in that was just that, ah, you know, that obedient part, lifting his hand, that he just, everything in his flesh said, no, but he did it. Yeah, and but that, that, that also him. shows what forgiveness does to changed a person. Him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And forgiveness. And, and letting, letting that hatred, anger, resentment go. And just sick. giving it to somebody else, just yeah. letting it go, Holding probably did do, do something to him spiritually that elevated oh, yeah. him and his consciousness and put him in a better place where he could say, these evil human beings who did what they did, even, even some of them can understand that what they did was wrong against humanity. Yeah. Like, I mean, it... Just because I don't care for they you doesn't on. mean that you can't, you know, appreciate somebody's pain. So there had mm -hmm. to have been some such an, inc an inc a heightened degree of brain, like just mind control over every oh, yeah. aspect of that regime. Definitely. Yeah, but it takes a supernatural 
element. That's that's where obedience. <laughs> if you have that, if you have just enough to be able to just you know do that little piece that God is telling you, then He could do something supernatural in you. And honestly, the guy probably suffered and wasn't even realizing it that you know having all of that anger still inside and not even fully aware of it. Right. Because refusing to forgive people, holding on to grudges and stuff is toxic. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I and agree. honestly, the, the advice to forgive and let go is more beneficial to the person that's forgiving than the person that's receiving the forgiveness uh, because it's, it's highly toxic. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of goes with the whole revenge is mine. Say it the Lord, you know, right. Give it to God, the, the best of your ability. But you know what? Sometimes your ability is just only so much. And you're going to be kind of stuck and just asking God to forgive you for not being able to forgive. But forgiveness is one of those conditional things. Forgive and it will be forgiven. So that's a huge, huge deal. And it's it's part of goes back to God being love. And uh, <laughs> it's one of the tough things that people who are, are not believers really probably struggle with. Or believers, too, for that matter. That's fair. Yeah. So um, let's let's take a, a little sidestep. Um, you know, we're we're living in a world of AI. So what role do you what what role does artificial intelligence, psychic abilities and astral projection play into the exploration of Christian ufology? OK, so, OK, you said astral projection yep. and. AI and what was the third one? Psychic abilities. Psychic abilities. Okay. And so, the exploration of Christian ufology. Yeah. All right. So um, I did research and I put that in uh, Aliens in the Bible that I believe that um, in Genesis 11, where the people were building the Tower of Babel, that there was more going on there than constructing a tall building. Um, that particular area. Uh, had sorcery as a root, you know, a lot of sorcery came from that area. And I, I honestly believe that they were probably experimenting with astral projection and they figured it out. Uh, that area there, the temple that was built there, um, was actually called in the Babylonian text, gateway to God. So it was a gateway type thing. So I theorize that it's possible that the people in that area might have been projecting out into the stars and found life out there and then asked them to come to Earth. So that's a possible scenario, I think. They could have learned how to do astral projection, and I talk a lot more in that. Mm -hmm. uh, the ancient legends actually talked about the gods coming down and being in the temple um, so that there was probably ETs there at the time. Uh, Genesis chapter 11 is also in the... Uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. You could actually take those two books and marry them together. Nimrod was Gilgamesh. The thing that diff that's different, though, is that they swap the antagonist and the protagonist. So um, Nimrod means rebel in Hebrew. So he was not a good guy. You, you don't even see that when you're reading the you know English version. You just see this guy who was this powerful warrior, and he started this city, right? Okay, big deal. And he's building this tower, and then suddenly God shows up and schwacks him and spreads everybody out all over the world, and they start speaking different languages, and that's where the languages come from. So what's that all about? That's and, always confused me. That is like yeah. the biggest question for me okay. on earth. Well, so you take the Sumerian text, and you come over here and say, well, here's the pieces that that's sort of lacking. Um, Gilgamesh, ignore the fact that he's the hero, right? because he's the hero. Why is he a hero? Because he's defying this being who brought the flood and he's building this great tower to escape the flood if the supreme being ever brings another flood again. So he's rebelling against God by saying, oh, I'll just build this gigantic tower. So if another flood ever comes, and forget that, that entity, you know, I'll, I'll defy him and even his flood isn't going to take me out. So yeah, but that's human here. ingenuity too, <laughs> which yeah. which was supposedly given to us for a reason. Correct, but for him, it was to rebel. Uh, or, you know, he chose to use his God given gift to rebel. Um, Epic of Gil Gilgamesh also says that his 
His mother was two thirds God, a, a God. So he was a Nephilim. He had angelic uh, lineage. So he was one of these hybrid people. He wasn't a giant, uh, but he probably had supernatural strength, possibly. He was definitely a warrior, definitely hard to fight. Uh, so you gather that, you know, and then also that this was a very advanced civilization that was building this tower, probably advanced scientifically in the construction, but also spiritually. And they probably learned some sorcery and stuff um, that they uh, learned from these ETs. And uh, just the, the same things that you saw in Genesis chapter 6, it's echoed in the, the book of Enoch, where it said they descended on um, Mount Horeb, I believe it was, uh, the watchers, the Bani Elohim in Hebrew, and the Anunnaki in Sumerian text. And they teach all, you know, they taught all the people these different things, right? But it's kind of like, uh, let's go give guns to the Indians, right? That's kind of what they were doing in a, in a nutshell, because they gave them so much knowledge and intelligence that they were becoming incredibly destructive way too fast. And uh, getting kind of big for their britches, in God's opinion. And it was messing up the time scale. They were becoming way too advanced, way too fast, and he needed to slow them down. So he showed up. He sent some angels here, and they scrambled the brains of everybody there at the tower so that they suddenly started speaking in different languages and diverging on these different language paths. So they had to break up into smaller groups and split apart and migrate away from there. So that's why God did that, because... They were given too much knowledge. They, they had too much knowledge, and they were growing and it, becoming way too advanced, way too quick, and they were rebellious at the same time, uh, it being led by this guy who was extremely rebellious against God. Uh, so that whole society just kind of crumbled when all their languages got messed up. Um, now, you would think that, uh, that if they were a civilized people like respectful and everything that maybe they'd try to figure out these language barriers and sort of work things out. But you notice how they just split apart and they all went separate ways. That to me says that they were probably also just fighting amongst themselves all the time and that there might've been some violence and uh, they finally decided, you know, what, I, I'm just going to get the heck out of here. And all of them, you know, split up and went in different ways. So that's the astral projection part. Uh, the other part that you mentioned was um, psych. Was it the uh, oh the psychic abilities? Psychic abilities. So uh, I believe that um, and the creation of artificial intelligence. Okay, so artificial intelligence is in Revelation thirteen. That one's an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible actually predicts that in the end times, uh, when the Antichrist comes to power, he's going to order humanity to create this being. Uh, it refers to it as a statue in, in that language uh, or an image, create an image of the beast. Uh, but this man-made thing can speak. It can make decisions. It's very intelligent. People are in awe of this man-made creation that is intelligent, operates independently, and it's put in charge of global commerce. Uh, so... Global commerce, all of the economies of the world are kind of like regulated through this thing, this man-made thing. And it's also the thing that implements the mark of the beast. So it's a global tracking system. So this has got computer technology written all over it. It's a man-made mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. It's in charge of the global economy, and it will eventually implement a global tracking system. So... What do we see nowadays? We see cell phones. There's your global tracking system. We're moving in this direction. Eventually, cell phones, I see them integrating, wanting to integrate cell phone technology into the human consciousness and getting people to where they could do internet queries with their brain. Yeah. Uh, I believe Elon Musk may even be working on that, even though it's, it's Neuralink or what, what, what is that what it is? Isn't that what Siri is? And I'm not being funny. I mean, no, Siri, Alexa, it, yeah. that's the, you know, uh, chat GPT, though, it's going in that way because mm -hmm. computers are learning how to think and speak and assimilate culture just like a person now. 
Mm. Imagine how advanced a computer would be if it could integrate with the human brain right. so that it would be directly fed from our, our uh, neural network, our wetware network. Um, they already so th have. This is in Revelations. Then in how much longer do we got, John? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a timer here for a we're long. there we're we're seeing all these things um, the ufo connection too um jesus said of all the times in history he said he's coming back right so we've been waiting all this time okay where are you at jesus why is it taking so long he said it's going to be like the days of noah when i come back that's a huge huge sign what are the days of Noah? The days of Noah is when otherworldly beings were coming into this world and they were genetically mixing with humans, messing with our DNA and integrating themselves into our society. So our computer technology, in part, is probably inspired by them, like Roswell crash and whatnot. I, I think that we got a jump start and reverse engineered some stuff to get where we are so quick in the last hundred years. Um. This is otherworldly beings coming here. So that's the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. This will be, I will, when I come back, it's going to be as the days of Noah. And then he specifically mentions, if you look it up in um, Matthew 24, Luke 17, he gives this whole laundry list, you know, wars and rumors of wars and uh, the sky will be darkened <laughs> like what just happened. Uh, he said that uh, the stars will fall from the sky. Um, Revelation 12:4. Uh, you see the dragon dragging a third of the stars from the sky and casting them down to the earth. So that this is a reference to the the deception. Yeah, yours and, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Satan deceived a third of the angels. Uh, you can gather from a Revelation twelve four. The word star translates as angel and actual star. They're connected. Uh, you could see that all over in Scripture. Job thirty eight is another example. The stars of God saying to you know glorifying God before the foundations of the year. Angels are spoken of as being in the heavens. The word heaven in the Bible, shamim in Hebrew, 657 times. In most translations, it's a plural word, and it refers to the abode of the sun and the moon and the stars. It's defined in Genesis 1.14. And a lot of people see this heaven, and they Christians get kind of confused on it because they think, oh, you die, you go to heaven. It's this other dimension. It's not in this universe. No, this is a multidimensional universe. Heaven is part of it. And the planets themselves are multidimensional planets. All so the planets I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. So heaven is on earth, potentially? It will be. So there is a first heaven. So the Bible actually describes three heavens, and there is first heaven that's on earth. It's in the sky. We're actually in the crust in the middle of this planet. It's a multidimensional planet like an onion uh, with layers of lithospheres. And when you change your molecular frequency, you go down lower into a lower dimension. Hell is in the heart of the earth, literally, according to the Bible. Jesus said hell is in the heart of the earth. It's a smaller planet inside of earth. And then there's a first heaven. Heaven is a bigger planet in a glorified realm in, in when you increase your glory. So like if we had an angel's ability to change our molecular structure, we would find ourselves inside of rock or lava. It reminds of, me of Dante's of Inferno, the way that you're describing it. it. It's very much. And it's also described that way in the book of Daniel. Um, when Daniel was praying, um, Mike or Gabriel came from the heavens. He descended to the earth, but he was hindered by the prince of persia and he had to fight there he was delayed 21 days michael came and fought him and broke him through that and then he got through to daniel then when he left he had to go through and penetrate that air realm again so if you can imagine i actually have a, a little picture of um, a okay. diagram of this let me um see if i can get my mouse situated i could share that um but it's, it's this whole idea of the earth being a layered onion. Okay, here it is. Uh, slide. Oh, share screen. Here we go. Window. Sorry for destroying the momentum there. You're good. 
Uh, okay. So as you can see here, it is here's the, where we are right here, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Daniel starts praying. And you see uh, Gabriel coming over here, and he's headed down, and he has to change his frequency or whatever, go to a lower level of glory from this higher dimension that he's in. Uh, but before he's able to do that, this Prince of Persia is an angel that occupies this area over here uh, above the area on Earth where Daniel's at. He has to, he's captured, delayed, detained. Michael fights him. He penetrates. He comes back through, gives his prophecy to Daniel, which is this astounding prophecy about the Antichrist and all of the stuff that's coming up in the future. And then when he said, when he leaves, he says he's going to have to encounter him. So he's going back to heaven, right? This is the first heaven, fights his way back through. Then he's in the second heaven. And then the third heaven is a glorified planet where God has his capital. And that's in the Northern Hemisphere. And the Bible actually has three scriptures that associate heaven with a physical north direction. So it's a glorified planet in the northern part of the hemisphere, uh, in the northern part of the universe. Uh, let me um, stop that. So you see this multidimensional structure going on here uh, in Daniel, and, and we also experience it in our life. And then that's like what I said, when a person dies, they sink down to one of those lower onion levels. But there's also higher levels. Uh, Do you think that we are uh, physically able to travel between the dimensions uh by elevating or lowering your conscious consciousness yes mm. so astral projection will do that i i read a book um by uh i got really kind of studied it quite a bit and that's when i was actually experimenting with it myself but dr robert monroe actually had this happen to him uh it started when he was asleep one night and he woke up, he had to go to the restroom and he got out of bed and walked over to the bathroom to go to the bathroom and his hand went through the doorknob. He turned around and saw himself laying on the bed and freaked out, got sucked back into his body. So that was the first occurrence. So he was kind of a loose fit. That little switch that, that integrates your, your spirit with your physical body. And, and I say physical loosely because your spirit's actually physical also. It's, but it's just like this exotic matter and it's not as dense as your physical body but it is matter it is atomic structure else ghosts would not be able to manipulate objects like electricity and radio frequencies and stuff like we know that they do they're interacting in the physical universe because they have a type of physical structure uh they could turn into like gaseous form and whatnot but they they are mo molecules right uh atomic atomic atoms they're composed of a type of atomic structure but um, he actually learned how to do this at will, like really easy. He could pop in and out of his body. And then his book describes all of these locations. That's kind of where I get part of the idea that maybe the idea of purgatory, that there's has some merit. He, he went to these different places. Uh, another interesting part of his book, I really, I really liked it because he was sort of an agnostic himself. He had seen so many things in the spirit realm that, um, and he had encountered a lot of really hard-nosed Christians and whatnot that like would refuse to acknowledge the things that he literally experienced. Um, but on more than one occasion, he was in a place he called Locale 2. I think that's what he called it. And while he was in this location, the first time this happened, he heard this trumpet, what sounded like a trumpet blast. And he said, all the spirits that are there have to just immediately drop down and lay flat on their back facing up. And they're like froze, like they're not moving. And he was like, the way he described it, he wasn't even sure if he could move. He didn't bother to question it because the force of something coming was so powerful that he would not, he just wouldn't move. He, he didn't dare question it. And he said himself that this was either God or God's son that he believed because of the power of it. And that this, it was like this entourage that would go through this place periodically and they would pick souls off of this giant bridge or something like that. They would pick them out of there and they didn't know what happened to them. We just get picked out of there. 
and then it would go away and then the trumpet would blast again and then everybody would get back up and they were going about their business like, oh, that's just the usual thing that happens here when you're in this place. And, uh, I, you know, with my my biblical perspective, I'm like looking at that and I'm like saying, you know what? I bet that's purgatory, but it's a place of extended grace. It sounds but like it an abduction to scenario to me. Well, <laughs> well I, I do believe that um, that the rapture in the future will be a mass alien, you, you know, abduction, abduction, planetary, because mm -hmm. angels come in chariots. And a chariot, an angelic chariot, is an intergalactic, interdimensional vehicle. Um, now you're talking ancient alien theory. Ancient exactly. Theory. The only difference, I, I, I'll quote all that stuff all day. Yeah. I, I know all their stuff uh, in that respect. But the difference is, I draw a line when it comes to God, because God himself, he created time space. Aliens can't create time space, all of existence. Maybe an they alien, can maneuver it. They can certainly maneuver it. They might even be able to go back and forth a time. I don't know. God, God controls all time, though. So they wouldn't be able to do anything without him specifically allowing it. And if he did allow it, then his level of planning, he's omniscient. He's well beyond anything we could possibly comprehend. So even if they're bouncing back in time, and maybe there's even this complicated multidimensional you know, parallel world thing going on where we have different decisions that we make in our life and we're, there's duplicates of us somewhere. Who knows? Who knows? I just think the ultimate algorithm of creation is to maximize salvation for all of his created life, to try to get as much out of it as he possibly can, make that cross count for as much as it possibly can because he paid a huge price for it. So he wants to get the bang for the buck. And uh, I, I think that that's why this place was possibly a place of extended salvation or, or extended opportunity for salvation where the spirits that are there, if at some point they start to think, you know, they start talking to God, start communing with him, start praying, and they don't give up, that by faith he might, they might be among those who he picks out and takes with him even though that while they were alive, they were on the fence or whatever. Um, at some point, maybe they made that decision. And in that place, they might have that extended faith. Um, but regarding the mass alien UFO abduction thing, um, which is slightly a different topic, but sort of the same, um, I think it literally will happen in the future that that's the hinging point. And it's in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, where it talks about a great restrainer on this planet that's holding everything together and keeping the Antichrist from breaking through into this world and, and wreaking havoc, like taking control over the planet. Because it says the restrainer is preventing him from being revealed. How do we how do we how do we decipher who is a tr a true disciple or prophet versus absolutely bonkers, crazy ass people? I mean, we've we've had examples of this throughout time, like Jim Jones and, um, you know, the there's been multiple groups that have claimed um, that they're going to see the heavens and they are the only way to get there. And they have to follow, you know, this one person. Be many get, deceivers. Yes. How do how do you how do you decipher who is a deceiver and who is uh, a true a true believer who who can help you with with getting to where we want to go, which I guess essentially would be a finer place such as heaven. Yeah. So there's there's two things. It's pretty simple, um, and um, I I could go look up the scriptures for you, but. Um, that would take some time, but I'll, I'll just enumerate these two things for you in the, in the book of John. Uh, he said, if somebody is saying that they're a prophet and they're making all these claims and whatnot, and then they say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, don't listen to them. So a lot of these people, they'll make a prediction and then it doesn't happen. And they're like, oh, uh, wait, wait, I was off on a calculation. I was, you know, whatever. 
it's, at that point, Sayonara. you say, dude, <laughs> dude, you lost, you missed it, right? Yeah. Here's the scriptural address of why I don't listen to you from now on, right. right? And a lot of them meet that criteria. The other criteria is even if they do have a degree of accuracy, but then they spouse things that are not from the Lord, that are strictly, and it's just like straight up opposed to basic things that the Bible says, that God says, you don't do this, then they're a false prophet. They're teaching you things that are wrong. Um, I could get, uh, I don't know how uh, controversial this show is in terms of like throwing other religions under the bus, but uh, I do have some other examples of other religions that I could straight up tell you this religion espouses this and this religion espouses that. And then here's the scriptures where those are wrong and that those religions were headed up by people in some cases, psychopaths, um, you know, and they went off on this tangent because, in, and they, they could have easily been identified if people just simply held to that scripture that says it, they are deviating in another way. And, even the Apostle John, he wrote about the, the Gnostics. And so this was happening even in the days of the earlier church when uh, when the apostles were still alive. They were starting to spread a teaching that Jesus was not a human, that he didn't have a body of flesh and blood. And so that's why uh, John said, here's how you know whether somebody is of the spirit of the Antichrist. If they say that Jesus did not come in the flesh, then that is of the spirit of the Antichrist. So they were denying that God actually became a human being in the body of Jesus Christ. And scripture is very clear that um, Jesus laid aside his divine power when he became a human being. That's in uh, for, uh, Philip, the book, um, Philippians. Um, ah, scripture's eluding me, but basically Jesus said he considered his equality with God is not to be grasped. I mean, it says that um, in the uh, in the King James, which is a little sketchy, but basically what it what it means is to become a human being uh, and ex experience the full scope of being human, he had to lay aside his divinity to do it. Tipperary. So how did he raise Lazarus from the dead? He relied on God the to father do that and he asked by faith that he would okay. do it he okay. did not do that himself even though god's power went through him he would have told you he, that's why he told his disciples greater works than i've done will be done through you so they would he enabled them to do the same thing through the same faith that he was talking about he was always berating them about faith you know like you guys need to have faith uh, so there was very, there's a lot to really understand there and to grasp. Uh, but basically, he had this amazing faith, and I believe that he he did no. So even though he set aside his divinity, there were some things that God the Father would tell him that would impart to him. So he would get words of knowledge and stuff, just like a person can have these prophetic gifts. Yeah. So there's a there's like a a direct mental connection uh, mm -hmm. when when needed. Right. Mm -hmm. So. But I think, God was, don't you think that we can all do that, though? Do you, do you believe we that we all have the ability to have that connection? I do believe that. Yeah. I do believe that. And and it's just one of those things. I think that it, a lot of it stems from how much time a person spends in prayer, how much time a person spends seeking after God, and how hungry they are in the Spirit to reach after God. The hungrier they are and the more time they dedicate to that, the more God will answer I mean, he will respond. Uh, those who seek will find. You knock and he will answer. Or, you know, he he knocks at the door. If you let him in, he comes in. So seek and you will find it. That's all the stuff that Jesus said. So he told us what we need to do. We need to be persistent, like ridiculously persistent. And, um, you know, that's all of that. And, and if you want to uh, want all of that in a single word about Jesus laying aside his divinity, that's kenosis uh i believe that's a greek word and it, it refers to that god becoming fully human and it talks about it like mm -hmm. when he sat there at the woman with the woman at the well he the reason he sat there and started the dialogue with her is because he was tired it said he was weary and he sat there with her and then he had a conversation 
if he had all of his divinity, he would never get tired. Uh, he wouldn't have been able to be killed on the cross. And that's one of the things that these, these Gnostics were teaching, that no, he wasn't actually killed on the cross. Uh, you know, because you can't kill God. It's, you know, he's divine. But he literally allowed himself to become a mortal human being to be murdered on the cross. And then after that suffering, that penalty of sin and death, or, or that would come to somebody through sin, but he was sinless. And that's why God the Father resurrected him. And he was the firstborn uh, of the resurrected. So um, that's why he has the ability. And, and he promises to give that to us uh, if we put our faith in him. I, <laughs> I tell you, I give you credit, John. You're very convincing. I, I, I love your, I mean, you're very knowledgeable, passionate. It almost enough for me to get the Bible on an app, the easy version to read without the thousands and the haves and all that. Yeah, too bad I can't actually give you the scriptures. I, I don't have all of those. Like, you've done enough. Like, you, you know, you've like, made an impression on me. I have to ask you, have you ever done a, like a debate with, um, you know, an, an atheist or something? No, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, you know, you, you're familiar with Hitchens, correct? I, I, you know, I, I, I uh, speak with people like you kind of like regularly uh, that um, people like that will, well, no, I, I'll just say people that challenge me with these like ridiculously hard theological questions on a show that's not normally theological right mm -hmm. and and uh it ends up becoming a much more theological conversation but it's cool because it challenges me to sharpen my sword right i, I and now i'm like dad gummit i there's like 50 scriptures i should have in my head and i i, I want to get better at this because honestly uh it shouldn't be a hard sell to convince people to want to go to heaven right uh but in the, today's world, it, it really is a hard sell. <laughs> it's a hard sell. There's, there's too many temptations, and it's too difficult to be good. Everybody has their... their difficult accountability kind of account side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's where we are in our age. You know, we, we get away with so much. Um, well, and then there's some people, Tiffany, that will just party hard and, you know to yeah. whatever ecstasy fantasies during the week and then go to church Sunday morning and think it certainly uh, are, you know, I'm forgiven, you know, I'll yeah. put my temper. Right, you know, you, the you, church you got and, your, uh, yeah. your, your mafia goons that go put a cap in somebody and then go throw a 10 grand in the church tithe and think they're good, you know, and, and they have like, the protection. And, yeah, uh, sorry, dude. It doesn't work that way. You're in for a, a very rude awakening. It uh, depends. Uh, you know, I've I've had a lot of my faith challenged and questioned because of uh, bad people in the system, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you know, there's billions and billions of dollars that have been divvied out through the Catholic Church over the the past thirty thirty years or so. And and that that makes it difficult for some people to relate, I believe. And I think that's where Kevin has has sort of um, made me think harder throughout the years on blind faith versus um, human culpability and yeah. uh, and and the nature, the demonic sometimes nature of man and and getting away with things and then going to church and being like, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. Mm -hmm. And then it's granted. All you have to do is beg for forgiveness and you're you're there. You're there. You are. I think that's part of part of the the, the struggle that a lot of people have. And um it's interesting to see somebody who has such passion for it and still has this uh, large view of of what the universe may really hold and, and the communications that we may see, the the grandeur of um, uh, the universe mysticism. never stopped being <laughs> mysterious. Right. Um, yes. Uh, I am a mystic. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I will claim hold to that title. Um, out of the Gospels, I gravitate to the book of John, or to John himself, right? He did mm -hmm. 
uh, the Gospel of John, and then John 1, 2, 3, and Revelation. Uh, all, all my favorites, like just the best, right? And it's it's the way he talks. When you read John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. I mean, I could just, just read this and just like fall into it. Like this guy was just so saturated with the Holy Spirit and connected with God that, you know, and of course he has my name too. So, or I have his name rather. Uh, so I, I just like that a lot. And, um, and, and the, the, just the questioning too, which is, it, it's kind of got me in trouble. You know, like when I was a kid, uh, I would be the one to ask all the questions about, you know, ghosts and, and uh, things like that. And, and when I was younger, of course, half people I talked to as a Christian, especially if they're a little more on the fundamentalist side that, you know, shut me down. They didn't want to hear about it, you know. Oh, it's demonic. They put that big label on there. And then I, I've been getting into debates, too. I, I have been in debates. There was this one guy, uh, Gary, Gary Bates or something like that. Boy, he just, I'm telling him, I'm telling him, Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10 and 2 Kings, these, these angelic chariots, that that is a UFO. How can you not see that? Yeah, the Ezekiel's and wheel. Absolutely. I, I'm trying to explain to him like, okay, even if it was a chariot, it's technology. Right. It's we we Kevin and I go back and forth about tech uh, the terminology. We only mm -hmm. have so many words to describe things, right. and and that hasn't changed in two thousand years. Right. We still don't have the word. I guess ineffable is the best way to describe because you can't yeah. you don't have enough words to describe certain situations and certain um encounters well so, Ezekiel's just so he's so literate and he's so detailed in his descriptions that he kind of takes you beyond that he, he he tells you literally the wings are straight and they don't flap there's mm -hmm. wings on the bottom and they touch with the wings on the top right on the distant ends so what is that shape yes that's the shape <laughs> mm -hmm. that is the shape wings on the top Mm -hmm. wings on the bottom they touch on the ends that yep. is what a flying saucer looks like from a side view and then when it turns mm -hmm. sideways it's a disc it's a circle and if mm -hmm. it's got a, another circle part it's a wheel within a wheel if it's got these portals around it there's your eyes it, and it may have had some logos like on it like we put logos on our aircraft right we put like the lady you know the mermaid on the front of the aircraft or whatever well what if these angels like to do the same thing and they have the bull's head over here, and they have the human over here, and they have the, you know, the, these these four headed thing. And the, yeah, Ezekiel's the saying, "Why, well, you know, I see these these animal, you know, four heads, you know, and these wings, and it's just so confusing." And and then this the macabre. This is a portal that is above it, right? He says, "Okay, it's got this glass." crystal -like dome on the top, right? So it's this transparent dome on the top. The bottom is made of beryllium. He literally says the substance beryllium, which we use to create rocket nozzles on our jet aircraft and our space aircraft, right? So how would that word even be available to them then? They knew what beryllium was. Yeah, they knew what it was. I mean, it translates as beryllium. They knew what it was. <laughs> Now, and to them, did they have refined beryllium? All he knew is that he used the word. He says that it's got this color to beryllium. So that's kind of interesting that it says that. Yeah. And we know that beryllium is made in modern space technology that we have, right? And then above this aircraft, a lot of people get confused about this. They see God's throne and God's up here. Like he describes it as this portal opening up. But get a clue. This is an interdimensional intergalactic spacecraft in order to travel to these other planets. And our science already knows this. Our quantum physicists and stuff, they've, we've calculated it out. We know how to do this kind of propulsion. They even hammered out the math to it in 2012. And they were testing it. So they can actually, if with enough power, create a wormhole, right? <laughs> This, Are we talking about uh, what I thought was going to happen yesterday with CERN and the eclipse? <laughs> the end of the world is 
coming. <laughs> yes, yes, CERN may very well do that. And it may open up to one of the lower planes and yeah. And <laughs> unleash we can talk Revelation about this for 9. another we can talk about that topic for another oh, hour. We we gotta get John back on because uh, uh, uh there's just I still I think we're like halfway through the conversation with him, yeah we two did, hours in. So. But Kevin, we're gonna need you to focus on some very specific topics. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I thought we did have topics, but you know, I kind of wandered. I'm sorry. But, you know, but no, this, <laughs> That's is, all right. this is. I've always said this is where I push back on Tiffany because Tiffany wants to come in with like structure, and <laughs> I want a conversation. You know, just yeah. I don't know, John. If you will ever go to a bar with have a beer, I would be there with you and just talk. Uh, this this is the kind of stuff I would just love to talk about. Well, and, yeah. I, I, and, I would have to have a coke. So um, <laughs> one of the addictions I left behind when I turned 21, right? Uh, like I told you, when I had that dream, when I woke up, I had all these addictions, right? And I felt like I was given a free pass, kind of like a choice. Like, dude, if you want, you could drop all of that and not even feel it. Mm. So I did. I'm like, I'm pouring all the alcohol down the drain and I got rid of other things. And uh, my friends thought I was nuts. They were like, dude, <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm like, you better become, come and get this before it goes down the toilet. That's all I got to say. Becoming a healthier human being. <laughs> and and, and a better... I never felt the tiniest fragment of addiction. You, I was you, just, it was just lifted off of me. It yeah. was lifted off of me. Like, okay, all the chemical, whatever, um, you're exempt, free pass. Good. And I, I kind of take that. I was 21. I was the age of accountability, which mm -hmm. the, in the Bible, they talk about that, that the um, it goes back to Moses crossing the Red Sea. And everyone that was 20 and younger, they got to live like 21 and older. Sorry, you're going to die in the desert. You know, you're not going to get to go to the promised land. I was right there on the cusp. I was even 21, but I just barely turned 21 a couple months ago. So I thought, eh, give or take a couple months. Come on. And so he gave me this dream and uh, kind of let me know, dude, you're in for some serious consequences if you don't change your game now. And so I said, OK. So unfortunately, that kind of really made me an oddball in the military after that, because everybody wants to go to the bar and have a drink and listen yep. to stuff. And I'm this, you know, nerd computer guy and just fish out of water type dude. And then I would have conversations like this, you know, and don't necessarily fit with every context so it's a challenging yeah. conversation even for us to have so uh we have a lot of broad range conversations throughout our show history but i do appreciate your um your research and your intelligence on this this topic it has been overwhelmingly insightful and um we'll we'll put in your uh links to your books and uh, definitely people go out and check out um, John's uh, website. Um, John if you have any questions, I'm sure that he is his willing to share some answers with you or at least a little bit more discussion on the topic. So thank you, John, for coming in and joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Very good. And, and we, we have to do it again. So we'll definitely Absolutely. figure that Peace out. out. There he is. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, heavy. Good. It was good. And it, it it's hard. Yeah, I, there, I could have chimed in with, but, you know, I was in a listening mode. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff he was saying that, you know, truth is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, you know, fluent with the Bible. And. Mm -hmm. And and I actually wasn't. I'm not joking. It literally makes me want to get, you know, in an app and in in it one of those versions where it's more user friendly. You know, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and read through some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and you know, this is something I brought up. I said the. Uh, I know he's in the back, and we're we're gonna get talk to him a little bit. Uh, so hang hang tight, John. Um, I would love to do host whether it's this show or or another i do it on my own mm -hmm. a debate 
Because mm-hmm. are you familiar with Christopher Hitchens? He's a, mm-hmm. hey, you could, well, he would go on these, you know, uh, debates, you know, around the U.S. with various priests or something, and it was very structured. You know, just I think I found my guy. You yeah, know, on absolutely. And this corner is, you know, and then <laughs> no, this is. Um, I enjoyed this. I did. I I, ha- I can say I, you know, I still look of think of the Bible as more stories. You know, it's you know some of. But it. that's why I appreciate a lot of it um, because yeah. I, I I did enjoy the stories um, and and that's what I try to tell my children. You know, if if you don't understand it, that's okay. It's okay right. because there's a lot of amazing. Um, stories that are relatable if you translate a, a little bit more to modern times. And if you don't understand it, like I don't, then listen to someone who can explain it. Right. Ask the questions. Ask the questions. Who can can help you understand it. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, he did a great job tonight. Uh, mm-hmm. He won me over uh, with his knowledge, passion. So yeah, uh, it's good stuff. I agree. Uh, we'll we'll have to definitely bring him on again. So right. that we didn't go through certain because I wanted to talk about there was uh, in like uh, one of his books, you know, Christians and he has his four perspectives of Christian ufology, uh, mm-hmm. one through four. ETs do not exist. ETs are mm-hmm. evil, and good, mm-hmm. evil and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, that stuff is just it's very interesting. I want I want to hear his thoughts and explanation for me is would be explaining some of this stuff too so yeah we got to get him back on yeah absolutely <sighs> tuesday night with tiffany mack and kevin hale you know universal secrets um well we we do we have anything lined up for next week yet i think we've got some options we just haven't we have some options we haven't pulled the trigger yeah we'll get that <laughs> All right, uh, for the people in the chat, the audience, appreciate you hanging with us. Um, Tiffany, always good to hang with you. We're awesome. going to uh, you know, follow us. Uh, I got I, I, something I don't do and I need to do often. If you are following the show, watching the show, give the show a thumbs up. Follow, like us, subscribe to our social media platforms we have in the description our links our link tree uh, which if you go to that you'll you'll find all of our social media links um you know tiffany and i are we enjoy doing this show and we want to keep doing it and um you know it it's uh it is rewarding for us when we um we feel like we're we have an audience to do this with and uh that's something we're gonna we want to keep growing and uh, having great guests on and you know. and I think I'm gonna have to break down and and put some swag out there and uh, we, we we're gonna talk merch and all that yes. stuff yeah we, we had got, our shows and yeah I think we're gonna have to bring that back and maybe um, put out little contests and things like that um, yeah. potentials for uh, getting a t-shirt or maybe a tumbler. Blanket. Or, we already have the blankets. We do. We do. <laughs> Is there going to be a contact with the compound this year? I would love to. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Yes. All right. Tiffany, uh, Tuesday nights with Tif- Tiffany Tuesday. Red lip to <laughs> Tiffany. Three, all, that, all that stuff. <laughs> Wishing everyone a uh, great night, great week. We'll see you next week on Universal Secrets. Peace out. This has been Universal Secrets.